I have a unique opportunity right here. I, I get to kind of play on that joke that Trey made earlier. He was standing between you guys and lunch. I'm the one standing between you guys and going home. So a little extra pressure right there. But there's a unique position in going last. And it's the fact that from this standpoint, you really get a chance to look back and hear what everyone else has shared, the amazing stories you got, and recognize connections. As I've listened to all these different stories come through, there's something that's really powerful about what's going on here at Mount Vernon. There's a real sense of passion and purpose behind what we're doing. And hopefully, as you hear what I have to share with you today, you'll begin to see just how important that is to us. But it's not about that yet. It's about what we always start with here at Mount Vernon. It's about starting with a question. So most people in the room are what they would consider to be teachers. I would consider all of you in some aspect to be educators. So this question is relevant to everyone. For a moment, I want you to turn and talk to the person that's next to you about why you got into teaching. Have a conversation for a moment. I get a chance now. I get a chance now to practice one of those skills that I unfortunately have to do a lot. I have to somehow get you guys to stop. And that's not easy. I usually call on a buddy to help me with this. Hey, Bo, could you give a whistle? Yeah, that's why we have pals, that's why you have buddies. So it's a painful aspect to have to interrupt those conversations because you're getting a chance to form connections. And I might not have been able to hear what you talk about, but I know there's enough of you silly little goofballs out there that you are probably cracking some of those classic teacher jokes. Like I got into teaching because of the money. That's right, that's why I'm doing these things. Or maybe some of you even say, I'm in it for vacations. Yeah, let's go. My favorite version of that, I got into teaching because of June, July, and August. <laughs> So we've all told something like that. Maybe some of you, you know, went above the fray, you know, and talked about, well, I'm in it because I love children, you know, which are all, mind you, great, great reasons. But I'm willing to bet that if you stopped for a moment and thought about that little conversation that you had and listened to and shared, there was probably some aspect of you getting into teaching because you wanted to make a difference. Something about you was a calling, I want to make a difference in what's going on. But that leads to another question. How do you make a difference? And that's really what it's all about. And so when I wrestled with those things, I did what, you know, I typically try to do. All right, let's see if I can find a role model. Who's someone that I know of that's made a difference? Well, this guy comes to mind, Steve Jobs. He's basically changed the entire landscape by which we interact with technology in the world. And he had a really audacious goal. He's over here talking about, I want to put a ding in the universe. That's big. That's bold. That's certainly a difference. But I'll tell you, I personally had a problem relating to that. I didn't have access to his network and his resources and his tools. There wasn't as much there as I was hoping there was going to be. So I found another great innovator. Some of you guys might recognize Marie Curie over here. Marie Curie was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize. As a matter of fact, she was the first person to win two of them, two of them in two different sciences. I mean, this woman made a difference. She actually invented the theory of radioactivity. That's making a difference. But there's a sad part to her story. It was her work and her research it actually cost her her life. Now, don't get me wrong. I love teaching as much as all of you do. <laughs> but I don't know if I'm at that point just yet. So there was something in her quote, though, that talked about children, that talked about childhood. And so I got to think, all right, well, who's someone that's made a difference in me from my childhood? It didn't take long for the answer to come to me. Everyone, I would like to introduce you to James Tiffin Sr. This is my dad. Nicole talked about the adventures that she had this man's responsible for giving me my sense of adventure. He took me out into the great, big, huge, wide world to show me all that there was to go and see. We went to rivers, we went to oceans, we went to lakes, we went up and down mountains. And while we were doing it, he reminded me, make sure you take a chance to be a little silly. So here I am, the great, big, brave explorer, fording this stream. I'm going to make it. I'm standing here before you. Yes, I did, in fact, make it across. But he reminded me, don't forget to laugh. 
And at the same time, don't forget to be reflective. I mean, you're standing on top of a mountain. I mean, you've overcome one of the biggest obstacles that could ever be put in front of someone. You've made it to the top and you've made it back down. That's a difference. He taught me about that. And I still go and I hike. I was on that hike that Nicole was talking about, viewing everything that there was. And, and there's a little story behind that bit of fruit over there. Whenever my dad and I would go up a mountain, we'd always have some little piece of fruit. And so even though he couldn't join me on this hike, at least brought a little bit with him. Oh, and yes, I was a little bit silly while I was up there too. Yeah, I, I got it. Even here on the ground, I got that. So, But what do all these stories have to do with teaching? What is it about these things that have some sort of common thread behind them? Well, if you stop and think about, you know, what Jobs did, what Curie did, and even what my dad did, they all found some way to provide an opportunity to go about making a difference. And that's really what we're charged with as teachers. Provide that opportunity for students to make a difference. But the way we do that isn't going to look like what we've done before. I mean, it's not a job of trying to create, you know, students that are going to compete with Google. I mean, we're not going to win that knowledge war with those guys. At any moment, thanks to Steve Job, we can whip something out of our pocket and find out whatever it is that we want to know. So our job isn't to do that. Some of you might even be familiar with the idea that the world is changing. You know, we're kind of moving out of this rules-based economy over here, you know, where anything that's based on algorithms and step-by-step -step processes are going to be replaced by machines. But it's the things that, you know, machines can't do that we need to start working on. Some folks that have been in the field for a little while might even remember a video that came out called Do You Know? It was put together by Scott McLeod and Carl Fish about, you know, the idea that the world is changing, that Facebook, if it was a country, would be the 13th largest one on the planet. I mean, and those numbers have certainly gone up. And he makes a great point in there. One, shift happens. Pardon me. But yeah, the world that we're preparing students for is not our past. It's their future. As you think about how the world is changing, really the only constant that's in place in this changing world is change. That's the only thing that always remains there. So the next question that comes from that, well, how on earth do you prepare kids for such a future? What is it that we do to get them ready for something where change is the norm? Well, another smart guy by the name of Seymour Papert talked about those ideas. And he talked about the idea of making sure that kids were ready and prepared to deal with situations that they weren't already familiar with. Something brand new came their way. No idea what it was, but they were ready. He even talked about it in terms of teaching language, that teachers, their job isn't to hand out ready-made knowledge, but to impart on them the sense of invention, that they can go and create and craft. So when you think about what's supposed to be going on with those sorts of things, you start asking, all right, what is it again that teachers need to do? Well, they need to provide students with that opportunity to make an impact. What is it that they can go and do that gives them that chance to make a difference in what they've done? Nicole did a great job of teeing those things up. Because to some degree, you can think about some of the basics that need to happen. For instance, you've got to get outside of the classroom. You've got to take your kids out into the world to let their curiosity drive where it is that they're going to wander and wonder. Put them in the world where they can see, smell, interact, figure out what's going on. At the same time, you've got to give them some new tools. You need to start giving them stuff like design thinking, where they can really focus on the human connectedness that's needed in order to make sure that things are people-centered as they go out and not only problem discover, but problem find. Give them the confidence to interview and talk and interact with one another. You have to give kids a chance to go and make stuff, to create, to build. And then one step beyond that, put that stuff in front of an authentic audience. Give them the chance to talk with someone that's excited about what they've got and can share that excitement that they've got going on inside them. Hey, let me tell you about this. And last but not least, we have to start blurring that line around this idea that there's teacher and student. Why can't the student become part of the teacher? Why can't the student share what it is that they've known? Better still, what happened if teacher and student both become learner together and pursue new ideas and new adventures alongside one another? So when we talk about educators, I mean, we've really got a question for them. What is it about those educators? You want to click, and yes, you did. What is it about those educators that we want to make sure that they've got? 
A wise mentor of mine once said that you cannot give to someone something which you yourself do not already possess. Now, right now, I'm going to stop Chip Houston because he's seeing this picture of Plato over here, and he's getting ready to tweet out some age joke about me. No, Plato was not my mentor, Chip. No, this was 400 B.C. I was hanging out with Archimedes. He was 200 B.C., so it's you is. But hey, spoiler alert about that. That idea of giving to students something which you already don't, or you already possess yourself, well, that's what's happening here at Fuse. You are out here right now to go and change, to make a difference, to see how you can make an impact. We've met three different partners over here that we're going to have a chance to go and influence their world and the work that they do inside this world. That's the opportunity that we need to make sure that teachers have so they can start to move it into their classrooms and give it to them. You don't know this guy. The guy in the yellow shirt is Chris Andres. Trey told us a great story about the houseless project. This is the guy, remember they went into the bathroom, they saw the sign, no bathing in here. I got a chance to work with Chris at that Traverse conference that Nicole was talking about. And while he was there, he had some really profound ideas. And it was around not just having the opportunities, but the courage to pursue them. This was a big part of his message. That yeah, when you see those things, step forward into that unknown and let this go. Take those lesson plans, Put them over there because your kids are curious about that. Let's see where they go. But a word of caution about that. We've heard a lot of great stories today, wonderfully impactful stories. But I want to caution you about what that means in context. I like to talk about this thing called the impact misconception. So as you look at this lunar surface right here, you can see lots of places where, you know, meteorites and various space objects have smashed into it and left huge debris fields, massive craters. We'd call those great big impacts. But if you look closely, you'll see lots of little ones too. As a matter of fact, you'll see more little ones than you do big ones. And there's something really useful about that. Because if we start thinking about giving kids lots of opportunities for little things, it'll start to grow. And even if we go back to Steve Jobs, where he was talking about that idea of a universe, if we think about what our students' universe is, we can absolutely give them a chance to make a ding in what they see at it. So for instance, in preschool, what's their universe? Well, their universe is their outdoor learning space. And it's kind of funny. Rosalind, you were talking about Anya hashtagging this. That's exactly what this girl said. I made this. And what you're looking at here is a sign that they went and they put on the frontier so that as their parents went to go and tour their outdoor learning space, they could find out where things are going. They created it, they made it, an impact in their universe. Or how about being a kindergartner? Who doesn't want to sit around and pound nails into wood and stuff? That's a great time. We do that all day long. But what happens when you give them a user? What happens when you give them a purpose? For instance, this teacher who told a story about the fact that all the little bugs and all the little slugs are coming in and starting to eat up all of her little goodies. If only there was a way to stop that. Hey, wait a minute. Some kindergartners can go and build you a raised garden bed. Wow, I did that for them. That's a big impact for a kindergarten. Or maybe it's this cute little one right here, where this girl's over here, you know, enjoying this comfy, cozy nook that her class actually went and designed, iterated, and built so they would have their own space in their classroom. And when you're in kindergarten, hey, that's a pretty big universe, your classroom, and they put a ding in it. Or maybe your universe when you're a first grader is the courtyard where you get a chance to go out and have recess. And you notice that sitting over there are some people that don't have anybody to play with. Hey, you want to come play? And they say, no, that's okay. I want to be by myself. And you see someone over there who's sitting by themselves. Well, this person wanted to be by themselves. I'm sure they do too. But really, they didn't. They were looking for someone to play. So how do you fix that? You build a sign. It says, find a friend. And when someone's sitting next to it, hey, let's go play ball together. That's a big ding in that first grader's universe. Or maybe your universe is actually a galaxy far, far away. And you're so excited because you get a chance to make your own pillow and you get to craft it the way you want. And so, yes, you are going to put a Death Star on there. You are going to put a TIE fighter over there and you are blowing some stuff up over there. That's meaningful to you. You did that. You created it and that was your idea. That's a big ding in your universe. Or maybe you've just figured out about this crazy thing called 3D printing. Oh, this is pretty cool. Look, we made a castle. What if I could make something for my little toy robot dog? Hey, could I do that? Well, sure you could. Let's figure out how to do this. So you, you go and craft that. You go and you make 
Well, a doghouse. Because your universe is your little toy. Or maybe it gets a little bit bigger. And you've got some good ears on and you hear Alex B. talking about, hey, geez, you know what? The substitutes keep forgetting to bring back their keys and their key fobs. I wonder if there's something we can do about it. And so you try. You put together a bunch of different little, you know, keychain reminders that are just big enough to sit inside someone's pocket or purse. So, oh, that's right. I got to return these things. You get a ding in your universe. Now you're starting to change something that's going on in your school. Or maybe you're still a second grader and you hear your gym teacher talking about, you know what? We're going to do this really cool unit at the end of the year. It's going to be about backyard games. We're going to play all those sorts of things that you're going to do this summer. But lo and behold, you, you don't have any backyard games to use in your gym class. So you turn some second graders loose on it. You make some cornhole boards. You make some ladder golf. You make a whole bunch of things. And you stand back and you smile with pride because that's what you made. But just when you thought you couldn't smile any bigger, you look down through the window and you see the middle school playing with what you, a second grader, made. Whoa, that's impact. The big kids are using my stuff. Yeah, check me out. All those things start to seed stuff because maybe it's even just a matter of how you share what it is you've discovered. I just figured out how to go and make this motor turn and it's gonna make the coolest scribble bot anybody's ever seen. But someone says, hey, how'd you do that? And now you've got a responsibility to go and share that knowledge with someone else. What I've learned can help you learn something new too. That's a big impact, especially when you're a third grader. Or maybe now you're in fourth grade and you've just figured out how to do color splashes and you want to figure out, hey, what can I do to make sure other people can see what I've done? And you figure out, wait a minute, I can put that on the desktop of the computer. And now every person that opens that up looks and sees what it was that you made and said, that's awesome. How do I do that too? You're spreading that idea, making that wonder, that discovery infectious because now more people want to do it. Or maybe you're just an insatiably curious kid who's really dying to figure out how this whole thing called soldering works. You spend some time getting the metal to melt, getting the connections to come to place so that you can light up your little badge. Then you take that home and you teach your dad how to do it because that's your universe. Those little moments start to make big dings in your universe. And as you get older, that universe gets a little bit bigger. So now we've got some students up here that are playing with this idea of a hearing wheel. So when you have auditory impairments and you can't hear those emergency vehicles going by, you don't know there's a fire truck or an ambulance by. But what if you could see them? What if you found a way to put some LEDs on a, on a steering wheel so that now when those noises go off, you see it light up? Oh, here they come. I better pull over. That's a much bigger ding in the universe. Or maybe you're going to take on the education sphere. Maybe you decide you're going to start a magazine where you're going to have student voice be part of this transformation that's taking place in education. Not as simply an observer, but as someone who's got a hand on that wheel and is shaping that conversation. So really, folks, the big thing that we're doing here is we're asking to give students, like Rosalind said, give them an opportunity to be change makers. Give them some chances. If we do that, who knows what stage they might find themselves on someday. Oh, I know. <laughs> Thank you.